So it's about excising the contagion on the negative side as far as doing on the ground for the sake of the body that is yet either less diseased or whole. And that applies on a micro level as well as a macro level. Um, meaning that there are individuals that have to separate. And as a king in training, you've got to know about that. There are going to be policies you have to develop with respect to that, too. The demonstration, of course, is to Satan about, see, look, your Truth Be Shaved program is not reducing suffering, and my Truth Be Free program shows how to overcome suffering because I have baptized suffering with a birthing. And, of course, sotto voce, God's still saying to Satan, you can avail yourself of this. Because Satan's suffering big time. Okay, Matthew 4 tells you that. He was baiting Christ to kill him. To obliterate him. That's how his mindset, his good deeds mindset, results in this total bitterness, total ennui, in the greatest person who's capable of doing more great deeds than everybody else put together in terms of his own native abilities. So that tells us a whole lot about the good deeds mindset and its result. So it's a bi-directional learning that's going on here. We can learn from Bible what's happening to Satan and company. And they are supposed to be learning from us because we're sort of mirroring, really, their own mindset down here. And they despise us to start with. And they laugh at us, but they're supposed to draw a parallel. If we're so ugly and puny and stupid and look how incompetent we are, what do you think is happening inside them? See, a person can have a lot of abilities, but like I said earlier, knowledge is crushing. All of your abilities count for absolutely nothing when you get a cold. That's a kind of disease. It's a small disease. It's short. It comes and goes. But you know what? It fells everything you are. You're in bed. You've got 90,000 Kleenexes on the floor. And you can't do anything but wait it out. So all your abilities count for nothing at that point. Just a cold. A little cold. Well, sin is like a cold. And you pile on sins on top of that, and then it becomes more than a cold. It becomes asthma or cancer eventually. That's the demonstration. That's why the trial continues. That, I mean, I'm going to get into this increment more about the trial itself. But that's part of why the trial continues. To demonstrate to us and to Satan and company, even though the cross is Christ's victory over Satan, what the results are, what got birthed from the cross, and what the alternative birthing is if you reject the cross. You can reject the cross as a believer. You can reject the cross as an unbeliever. Either way, guess what? When you reject the cross as a believer, you're going to get into the good deeds mindset, just like the unbeliever is. And you know what? It doesn't end pretty. It ends with you being miserable. It ends with you having spent your life for nothing, and you know that. Versus God's plan, first believe in Christ, you're actually in it. Second, start using 1 John 1, 9, get under your pastor, learn and live on Bible talk to God, and at times when warranted, talk to believers. That's God's system. So you get into the plan by believing in Christ. You get into the system through those other five steps. And if you're in the system, well, yeah, you're wrong all the time on something. You're also right all the time on something. And God is working on you, siring you, First John. Especially First John 2, and 3, and 4, and 5. He's siring you. And at some point, you're going to want to quit, if you're like most Christians. 
and opt for Satan's good deed plan, in which case, at, like Pharaoh, you're going to get to a point of no return, and then First John 5, 16, God's just going to kill you, because you're too much of a contagion for your environment. That's it. Meanwhile, the unbeliever is still stuck in Satan's plan, emulating Satan's own arguments, not knowing that they're doing that. And they're allowed to live for X amount of time, and they're infecting the world too, being aided by carnal Christians, actually. And at some point, they reach a point of no return, and being they have to die. Now, even after they die, even after you die, there's still an opportunity to learn something, especially in heaven, but, you know, in hell. They still got an opportunity to believe in Christ because he paid for all sin. Because God is righteous and should be paid for all sin. This is the main theological point that all the theologians, theologians I've ever studied are missing. God has to be paid for all sin. We know he has to be paid for sin, but we somehow are, we get brain farts and we think, well, it, you know, what about the sins of the angels? Duh, that's still sin. And it'd be harder to pay for their sins if you go down to human level, like Christ did, and pay on the cross. But it's a total no-brainer theologically, but our brains aren't on, so we don't see this. And it's also a total no-brainer that if God creates you in the first place, he does not want you to perish, just like Peter says. Not willing that anyone should perish. Well, if he's not willing today, what, he's going to suddenly become willing tomorrow? No, not willing means not willing. And actually, in the Peter verse, it means never willing. Ook. Greek, Greek word ook means not. It's a fact. Okay, but God doesn't change. He can, but doesn't. So what time is he going to change and ever become willing? Never. So all those angels and all those people who are going to be in hell, God is never willing that they perish. But they have to be severely disciplined. Because that's the only language they'll accept. They already believe God's an ogre. That's why they go to hell in the first place. To them, the whole idea of God is bad. The, you know, the God of the Bible. Okay, fine. So he's playing the role they believe in. Even if you believe somebody's bad, if you're hurting enough, you're going to want to give in. Especially since what God's arguments are, are so patently true. At some point, you're fighting between your stubbornness and his answer to your stubbornness. At what point do you give in? Say, okay, God, you're right. I'm wrong. Okay, zoop, you're out of hell and now you're in heaven. Why wouldn't God do that? He got paid. So it's just a question of how he wants to spend the money. Well, he wants to spend the money on creation. But creation doesn't want God to spend the money on them. Creation wants to do it itself. Well, so what is God supposed to do? Force you? That's the truth. Be shaved plan Satan wants. God's not going to do that. So that's the negative side. The flip side is high. If you go through God's truth, be free plan, which means God is free to pour himself into you because you keep saying yes. And when you say no, you use one John 1 9. And then you're saying yes again and again, you know, under your pastor, learn and live on Bible, talk to God, and on occasion when warranted, talk to people. Then you're in the system. He's doing his stuff to you a little bit, line on line. Precept on precept, he lingers. Because he loves doing it. So it doesn't matter that you're inferior. Hint, hint, Satan. This is the kind of happiness that I had in mind for you. That Christ went through all the way down to the cross. This is the happiness of Christ on the cross. He became sin. And he's still happy. He became sin. God's judging those sins in his own body on the cross. It's front and center to God forever and ever and ever. But they're happy seeing that. Why? Inquiring minds want to know. I want to know. I can tell you the doctrine, but that doesn't mean I understand it yet. Every day I live, it's like, how can you like this, God? And every day I'm getting a lesson in it. 
And the lesson I'm getting is on divine television. That's the point of this audio. It's not just happening to me in my little world and nobody sees it. It's on divine television. I don't know how many angels are watching me when I go to the bathroom or cook breakfast or sit at a computer, but I know they are. And instead of wigging out about it like I did initially when I first realized how true this is, it's like, okay, fine, you know. There's no secrets from God, so who cares if there's no secrets from anybody else? I'm a public person. I'm a king in training. I'm a public person. My public isn't necessarily my fellow man down here. Sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. But it, at all times, I'm a public person to God. So who cares if I'm a public person to the angels and whatever humans might be passing by to see what's on divine television in this believer's life today? I'm the star of my own movie by God's decree. So are you. And every day I learn something and every day I'm happier than the day before. I'm also, you know, suffering a little more than the day before too. Because God knows everything and that's all the low and that's all the high. So there's this divine stretch increasing the size of my soul. And it's all in my head. My body is just as dysfunctional as it was the day I was born. My sin nature plays just as much as it does, you know, at any other time in my life. My sins have changed. You know, I don't go in for the sex thing anymore like I did when I was in my 20s. I didn't go in for it much, but I did go in for it for a little while. You know, and the drug thing never really did much for me. I tried it a couple of times, I think, and it's like, what's this for? And just stopped. You know, we all go through those sort of lascivious periods. And they don't last very long if you're too interested in God. You just, you get distracted from that side of human nature and just get into the God side of human nature. But you see the point? I'm happier than Satan is. That's the testimony. That's why I'm in the docket. I'm on trial, so are you. That's Hebrews 11.1. Christ thinking is being built on me, precept on precept, and everything that's the result of that, the birthing, that goes with the suffering of knowing more, high and low, is on trial to the angels and are watching. Oh, look at what Brain Out learned today. They don't care that I'm naked and ugly and all the rest of it. Or maybe not ugly, it depends on who you know who looks at me and what they think of my appearance. But the truth is that the only thing that's beautiful about me is what God's doing to me. And they're seeing that. And they're cheering it, the elect angels. And the non-elect angels are busy trying to figure out how to make me screw up. And they're very successful at it every day. Okay. That's divine television. I'm on divine television, so are you. So that's your first, you know, this whole part seven increment is to introduce the trial issues of your daily life and you know, we've gone through the panorama now we're going to get into the nitty-gritty of the daily life In daily life you got all these you're, you have to recognize you're a public person you got to make policy okay you got to decide you know to, to look at everything you got as if it were your kingdom already in order to train for the one God wants you to have you're learning Christ the meanwhile that was the fourth thing and finally, you know, fifth, I mean, there's more than five even. You're learning how to communicate. You have to keep practicing what you learn and live on Bible to see if you know it. And your first communication, ideally, is you're talking with God about what you're learning to learn how to, to understand it. And you learn how to understand it by talking. At least talking to God alone. Whether you're supposed to do it my way, talking out loud in an audio or video, I don't know. I need to do that. Because I don't listen to myself when I'm just alone. I need to go through this extra step because I'm stupider than you are. And when I'm thinking on my own, I'm not, I'm not paying attention to my own thoughts. So if I have to put them out there for somebody else to read, suddenly I'm going to do my due diligence. So whether you're supposed to hear this or not, I'm not supposed to be concerned with that. So you see, communication. These are all kingship functions. And then, I guess we could say number six is this issue about excision. How do you relate to people? 
At what point do you cut them off? How far intimate do you go? Because there's a contagion issue. Meanwhile, all this stuff on the big panoramic picture is demonstrating to Satan what, what Christ wrought on the cross. And of course it's demonstrating to us too. But you have to know Bible to see that. I know what I'm telling you because of the Bible that's in my, in my head. Then I was able to take that same Bible, look at life, and say, oh, see, here's all these Bible principles playing out in life right now. Meanwhile, I'm also on divine television. That's the seventh thing. Right now, today. Every day. So there's no point in getting wigged out about it. You can't change that fact. Just get used to it or forget about it or something. But that's how it is. Meanwhile, on the ground, the other dimension of this communication thing and being on divine television is, at times, you are on the television of other people. It's really uncanny how that works. I've been stopped in grocery stores when I was waiting in grocery line. Somebody wanted to know something about God and I'm like, what, am I wearing the word God on a t-shirt? How do they know? And I'm not. I don't wear my faith on my sleeve. People are already too, what do you want to call it, um, they're, they're, they're too aware of the gospel and its darkness. And they're too upset about it. So that talking to them about it is not, not generally a good thing. Wait for them to come to you. Well, that's what God says anyway, so that's what I do. Okay, well, I've been stopped in grocery stores. I've had people talk to me in the middle of a party. In some of my other videos, I've talked about that. I mean, just like out of nowhere. I've had people come knock on my door. Okay, well, they don't even know who's inside that apartment. Total stranger. Want to talk to me about God? And I'm like, huh? I was in Washington, D.C. once. I was at this, I forget, the, the Bicentennial. I think, it, no, it wasn't the Bicentennial. Yeah, maybe it was the Bicentennial, 70, 1976. I was in Washington, D.C. for the Bicentennial. And these people started following me around about God. But I was just at the Bicentennial. I wasn't with anybody. I wasn't talking to anybody. And because those people were following me around, I ended up having to walk six hours in Dr. Scholl's shoes, and I had to literally crawl to the bus to take me back to where I lived outside of Washington, D.C. So that kind of stuff is going to happen to you. God will lead people to you. He leads them to you if you're making YouTube videos. He leads them to you if you're at work. You just, you, you just, that's what Peter said. Be prepared. Okay, be prepared means be prepared to communicate for the hope that is in you. So you talk to God about it. Or maybe you too are supposed to make audios and videos. I don't know. Whatever best helps you learn what you learned in Bible class under your pastor, now it's time to practice that. And you practice it by trying to live it out in your body. But you also have to practice it in terms of your head. Okay, I heard about Samson and Delilah today. What does that tell me? So you practice talking to God about it. You see the point? So you're on divine television. You're the star of your own movie. By divine decree. Like it, lump it. Your royal family of God, that's it. And sometimes you're on display to humans. And sometimes they just, I don't know, somehow weirdly find you. At which point God has deployed you. And that's why they find you. You don't go looking for them. And he, by what they say, you'll know what, what, he, what job he wants. And ideally you, you think to yourself, okay God, what am I supposed to do here? And you try and do it as best you can and you'll kick yourself afterwards. Because you'll always screw up something. But you'll always get something right because the Holy Spirit knows what he's doing. Christ in you, the confidence of glory. You're learning glory. And it feels terrible. It doesn't feel good. Glory does not feel good. Walo chadar. That's Isaiah 53 too. He, when he was down here, there was no glory we could see that we would desire. Unuch madehu. That's how the verse ends in Hebrew. 
No glory that we would desire, that we would esteem. Yeah, well, it doesn't play. It doesn't feel good when you're doing it. It's plotting. Katas kopon dioko. Philippians 3.14 It feels terrible. It feels boring. It feels like unsuccessful. You always see the failure. Okay? And that's exactly what Daniel 9.26 says. Christ is cut off. Karat in Hebrew in that verse. He seems to accomplish nothing when he dies on the cross. He just dies, that's it. Sins are just imputed to him, that's it, that's all. There doesn't seem to be any success. He doesn't seem to be birthing anything. But the contract was that it would birth something. Yeah, because God then just flat decrees. See, he seems arbitrary. My son allowed me to stab him with sins, so as a result of that, now I'm going to save people. Oh, really? What's the connection between the two? You're sadistic to your son. This is Satan's argument. You're sadistic to your son. He's a masochist. He, he's the head masochist. He allows you to do this. And now you say everybody's saved? Is that truth be free? Sounds like that's truth manipulated to me. And of course those of us who are saved are busy saying, Yeah, God, if you're being arbitrary, please be arbitrary. You see how this all fits together? There's a trial going on in heaven you can't see, but you can start to see it if you learn Bible. And there's a trial going on earth before the angels, which they are watching, and you can't see them do that. But they're actually learning from you. Little tiny stupid you. In the docket, on divine television, royal family of God, and all you do is hit the power button on the divine computer, 1 John 1 9, and John 14 26 is playing in your head, and you don't even know where the file folders are. Could it be funnier or more ironic than this, or what? God's pouring himself into me. I use 1 John 1 9. This is his system I study under a pastor. I'm learning these verses. I have no clue why they're so important. It happened 3,000 years ago to people I never met in a technology I can't even identify with. And God's going to make all this work to glorify Him? How? Well, you don't know. As you get into spiritual adulthood, you start to know. All this stuff I'm telling you is what is actually happening to you. And it's because you're clueless. It's because there's no innate connection between what you do and what God does. It's because He's, as it were, arbitrary. filling himself in you and you don't even know that that's happening so you can't call it a good deed on your part and in a way you almost can't call it a good deed on God's part which it just looks like total waste you're weak and he's wasting himself on you yeah that's the heart of the trial that's the heart of Satan's argument that's the heart of why Satan rebelled God's doing all the doing, wasting himself on me. I'm not doing anything for him. And I feel wasted while he does it. I'm weak. All I ever get for this thing that God does for me is feel weaker and stupider and more incompetent. This cannot be the truth. See how that's a real big trial argument? It's a pretty good argument, isn't it? Isn't that how you feel? Okay, I'm going to Bible class. I'm using 1 John 1 9. I still feel as shitty as I did before I used 1 John 1 9. My life still sucks. But I'm going to Bible class and I'm learning about this totally irrelevant stuff. But God's doing it to me. He says so. I believe Him. That's all you know. The angels are looking at you and saying, Wow. What a great believer at this moment. He believes God. Because they know what's upcoming. They've seen your story a thousand bazillion times in other believers who went the same route. And they know that if you stick to that course, you're going to be happy. You're going to know the answer. You don't know it now. You're in the faith stage. You just blindly believe it. You know Christmas is going to come, but when? 
as you get older in the spiritual life, you get to know God's calendar for your life. So you have what the Greeks called elpis, confident expectation in the future. That's called hope in 1 Corinthians 13. So you become aware. Oh, there is Christmas. Here's where it is on the calendar of my life. It's actually accomplishing something. All this blind learning of Bible and living on it, not knowing if I'm even applying it right or not. And as that confidence grows, because you keep learning Bible, and you start seeing more and more of the divine calendar for your own life, you begin to love it. And at that point, you start saying to God, Oh, please let me suffer. I need to suffer for you. I need to pour myself out for you. I need some kind of outlet for this need to do something for you. I know you're doing it, and I know it's actually going to cost you more if you do it to me. But I need something. Dad, yeah, that's what Christ was saying. I long for the cross. At the last Passover, that's what he told his disciples. And that's how you come to be. And that just, that just completely, utterly proves Satan wrong again and again and again each time it happens in a believer's life. And you could say to yourself, well, if you proved them wrong the first time, why does it go on? Well, number one, because Satan's so negative, he's got to see the proof again and again. Number two, not everybody in Satan and company is as negative as he is. And maybe if they see it 16,000 times, the 16,000 and first time, they're going to change their mind. Also, there's this promise of church, of a body replacing them, that Christ already paid for 2,000 years ago, and not all the bodies are developed yet. See, even if Satan was totally proved wrong, which he's been many times over, I'm still down here. I'm still alive. I'm part of what Christ paid for 2,000 years ago. Christ is owed a body. The body has to be grown and developed. It's a present to Christ. I am his property. So is Satan and company. But they've already said no. Okay, so part of the property said no. But part of the property not yet born, not yet completed is saying yes. So, time goes on. To bridge back to Israel's time anyhow. But the body's got to complete. It's a body. It's a body of people who Christ paid for 2,000 years ago who didn't exist at the time. And many of us, for however long church lasts, don't exist yet. Now that brings up the final aspect of this whole divine television, watching you be on trial, la di la completing the body for Christ anyway, Satan being proved wrong many times over but not getting it. But maybe somebody else will get it if they see it demonstrated the 16,000th and one time. There's one other element that's really, really important and it's very technical <clears throat> about why this goes on. And I guess I'll have to cover that in the next increment so you can go to the bathroom or something. Coming up next.